you are listening to the continuation of the story. You can listen to the previous part via the link in the description below this video. Happy listening. I needed to leave that conference room immediately. It seemed unbearable to stay there even for a minute longer. The feelings inside me overwhelmed me like a raging storm, threatening to tear away the last vestiges of self-control. If I had stayed just a little longer, I would have either slapped Eileen, unable to contain the anger that was literally bursting inside me, or, even worse, I would have rushed to her, hugged her and cried on her chest, which once. It seemed to me the most comfortable and warm place in the world. It is difficult to express in words the wild, all-consuming storm of emotions that raged inside me, like an unbridled hurricane, sweeping me over my head. My entire inner world was torn apart under the influence of these conflicting feelings. On the one hand, the love I still desperately felt for Eileen, despite the pain, betrayal, and disappointment, continued to burn inside me like an unquenchable flame. This love, which had strengthened over the years and taken deep roots, was too strong to disappear overnight. I couldn't just erase her from my heart as if she never existed. Even after what happened, I still loved her so much that this love was a part of me, an integral element of my being, which cannot be gotten rid of with a snap of my fingers. But on the other hand, I was torn apart by rage wild, unbridled, almost animalistic. This rage, all pervasive and destructive, shook me from the inside, from head to toe, and did not give me a moment of peace. I was so overwhelmed by it that it seemed like it could swallow me whole. It was anger not only at Eileen for her betrayal, but also at myself for the fact that I still could not get rid of my feelings for her. This rage grew every second as I realized that despite everything that had happened, the love for her still lived within me. I was angry at myself for allowing this woman to penetrate my heart so deeply that even her betrayal could not erase her presence. These two forces love and anger fought inside me, like two powerful elements, neither of which wanted to give in. Love clung to its territory, reminding me of all that was good between us, while rage demanded retribution for the pain it had caused me. I could not understand which of them would win, and this feeling of complete internal rupture was slowly eating away at me from the inside. My heart was torn apart between these two opposing forces, and I could not cope with the chaos. I was torn from the inside, as if I was being torn into pieces, and I didn't know what to do with it. Conflicting emotions mixed into an uncontrollable cocktail, and the only way I saw was to leave before something happened that I could not fix later. My lawyer left the room a few minutes later, looking furious. You should have given her more time to explain herself. You should have talked to her. This divorce could have been avoided. I'm sure she wanted to say something else, but her outburst had the opposite effect. It erased all the soft feelings I had when I saw Eileen for the first time since learning of her betrayal of my trust. Do you have signed papers? I asked dryly. Vicky waved the documents in front of me. That's all I need. Her firm gaze forced me to continue. What did you expect? When she said, I should have shared with you what's going on with me. Should I have asked her how her sex was going? Oh my God, she cheated. When she talked about taking a lover, I should have asked her how much better is he than me. Damn it, bitch. Take the papers, file them in court, and don't bother me any more with my ex's requests. Well, I knew for sure that we wouldn't have many client lawyer meetings anymore. In a month, I will receive an official court decision on divorce. Later that evening, after meeting Eileen, what she mentioned came to mind, my own midlife crisis. This happened almost seven years ago. I was turning 40, and, as was customary in my family, my hair began to turn gray, especially at the temples. If I didn't shave every day, my sideburns looked gray. This became a signal for me. I was getting old, becoming a gray-haired old man. Eileen kept saying that it made me look more established, that she found it attractive, but the fact remained that I was getting old. We were sitting on the couch together late at night when she asked, are you afraid that women will no longer find you attractive? With these words, she moved closer to me. I can say that you are still incredibly attractive. When we go out, I notice how many women glance at you, dear. I'm not jealous, but I notice it, and there's something they don't know. They don't know what a good lover you are. 
we made love. I was in seventh heaven, and all thoughts about aging disappeared from my head. I have an idea that might interest you, dear. Just tell me, honey, and I'll have sex with you again. She lightly hit me on the shoulder with the back of her hand. Not that stupid, although that's also a good idea. There's a nurse at work who works in obstetrics. Do you remember the one who said that she and her husband were engaged in partner exchange? So, I thought this might be just what you need. What do you think? We discussed this before, but as far as I remember, we weren't quite sure how we felt about the experience at the time. We discussed this topic for several more weeks. Before this, it was just a fantasy played out between two partners. Now we were discussing reality. Real people. We finally agreed to try it, despite some doubts we had. Eileen was to invite Wendy and her husband Tom to dinner to see how things would unfold. They arrived on Saturday, two weeks later. Both of our children were at their grandparents' for the night. Wendy was also a nurse. She was very sweet, despite being a little overweight. Her amazing doe-like eyes made up for any doubts about her few extra pounds. At 32 years old, she was about 162 centimeters tall, with light brown hair and, thanks to her weight, had very seductive large breasts. Her husband, Tom, was a couple of years younger than Eileen. He was 35. He was of average height and weighed about 175 centimeters and 82 kilograms. He worked as a sales representative for a large electronics company and could talk non-stop. I found him a little intrusive, but in the end, I wasn't the one who was going to have sex with him. Eileen and I agreed in advance that if either of us didn't feel interested, we would just stop everything and spend the evening like a regular dinner with friends. Both Wendy and Tom knew that we might be interested in having sex with them, but they also understood that we had to set our boundaries. Wendy made it especially clear that she understood how we felt because she went through the same process several years ago. However, Tom was more assertive. During dinner, he made it clear several times how attractive Eileen was. She was indeed a very attractive woman, but his constant innuendos and sexual innuendos began to irritate me. Luckily, my stubborn wife and soft-spoken Wendy responded very well, and Tom finally calmed down. After dinner, we moved to the living room for a tasting of 15-year-old cognac. Not knowing what to do next, Wendy took the initiative. She grabbed Tom, who was openly staring at Eileen, and sat him next to her on the sofa, while Eileen and I took the love seat. I turned on soft rock music. But at some point I realized, I can't do this. I don't have a problem with other people sharing, but it's just not for me. All sexual excitement instantly evaporated. Wendy noticed this. Is something wrong? I can't, I said. Volume. It's over. Damn it. This was Tom's only answer. They left after a few minutes, Wendy expressing understanding of the situation. After we cleaned up and took a quick shower, we ended up in bed. We discussed our mixed feelings about the evening. It was a mistake, I said. I see that, Eileen replied. I realized that this treatment was worse than the disease. I don't want to trade my midlife crisis insecurities for insecurities in our marriage uncertainty that I could lose you, lose our family. We made love tenderly, like two souls searching for each other. My midlife crisis was over. The next few months passed quietly. I drank too much and still resented Eileen. I didn't go on dates, although I received several proposals from colleagues. I know Tammy was behind these lunch and dinner invitations. My sex life was either self-gratification or tied to an agency that considered me a valued client. Who would have thought? Have you ever spent Christmas in the company of only prostitutes? She left the apartment when I passed out. Such evenings again kindled my anger, but they were rare and my life gradually returned to normal. Seeing my daughter often opened old wounds. At least she talked less and less about her mother as she began to notice how it affected me. A year after the divorce, Mary was finishing school. I only wanted to come to the formal ceremony at school, but Mary insisted that I come to our old house for a party that Eileen and her parents were throwing. Great, my ex-wife, surrounded by her loyal fans. The factor that tipped the scales in favor of my acceptance was the presence of my son Mark. 
I've only seen him twice in the last year, and I could never say no to my baby. The dreaded graduation day has arrived. Eileen's view of the day. Kieran has cut me off for the entire year since he found out about my lies. During that year, Mary and I tried many times to invite him to spend even a few hours with us, but he always refused. Even at Christmas, he chose loneliness, and it was not joyful for us either. We all knew he was alone at Christmas. I would accept my shame and guilt in an instant if it meant Kieran would spend any time with us. Mark was distant towards me, even a little accusing in his remarks. What a wonderful young man he is, just like his father. I look at him and see Kieran as he was when we first met. Honestly, it always pains me to notice the many similarities between Mark and Kieran. Their manner of speech, gait, smile. Oh, those smiles, they hurt so much. Mark didn't smile for me, but he smiled a lot for Mary. I pushed these thoughts aside. It was Mary's day, her graduation and I finally got the chance to see Kieran for the first time in ten months. Ten lonely long months. Even at work, I was persona non grata among my colleagues because of Kieran's lawsuit against my ex-lover. Thank God Kieran didn't sue the hospital itself. My father did not take kindly to our request to invite Curran to a family celebration. Well, my father never really accepted Kieran. Over time, he showed some respect. But for him, I always remained his baby, who was taken away by an Irish rake. There was no love between the old Scot and the husband with Irish roots. Of course, my father taught me a moral when he learned about my behavior. For a moment I even thought that he had sided with Kieran, which I would have been wholeheartedly happy about. But that didn't last long, and he took my side for the last year. I couldn't believe I still felt so bad. When we came to school for the ceremony, my eyes kept looking for Kieran. No sign. Mom, Dad, and I sat close to the podium where the kids received their diplomas. My heart jumped into my throat when I finally saw Kieran enter. He was dressed to the nines, loose-fitting gray trousers, a blue shirt with an open collar, and a light suede black vest. He looked as attractive as ever. Mark was next to him. They were like two peas in a pod. I couldn't help it, and tears flowed from my eyes. Mom patted my hand, trying to calm me down. Mark noticed us and pointed us out to his father. Kieran glanced in our direction and then chose a spot as far away from us as possible. Mark came over to hug his mom, dad, and me and then went back to his dad. During the ceremony, I kept sneaking glances at my two men. Is it possible to love someone so much and still feel so much pain? Yes, my thoughts were in turmoil. I almost missed the moment when Mary walked up to the stage to receive her diploma. Fortunately, my father took all the photographs. My stomach was in knots as we drove back home to a place where I had spent so many happy years, but the last year had been filled with grief, sadness, and loneliness. We finally got home, and I started cooking. Even though Kieran was avoiding me, I spied on him for the next few minutes. I don't think he felt any better than I did. He was very pale, almost gray. He avoided his father, mother, and me. Only in the presence of Mary and Mark did he perk up a little. At some point, Mary jumped into his arms. I'm so glad you came, Dad. It's not quite the same as before, but almost. I had to go into the kitchen so the children wouldn't see me cry. Mom followed me and hugged me. When I returned to the living room with a tray of food, the worst-case scenario was already unfolding before my eyes. Mary and Mark were looking at the photos on the camera, while my father was talking to Kieran. Well, young man, you finally pulled yourself together and returned. I didn't think you had the courage to do this, the father said sarcastically. Oh my, Kieran used to be able to handle my father's harsh judgments, but now, after everything I've done to him. Mom, Mary, Mark and I were all in shock, our mouths open as we watched these two stubborn men engage in a verbal battle. Well, go to hell, old man, Say, you look sick. Maybe you'll die soon and make my day happy, Kieran replied. And then I learned the terrible news. Well, boy, you'll be glad to know that I'm really going to die soon. I wanted to tell this to the family more delicately, but thanks to you, the secret is out. The doctors won't give me more than a few months, so your wish will soon come true. 
If it was possible, Kieran became even paler. He looked at his father with his mouth wide open, as did everyone else except his mother, who looked at Kieran with anger. He probably just lost his only ally among my family. For a moment, my wonderful former husband returned. He took his father's hand. Sorry, old man. Really, sorry. That's not what I meant, Kieran said, and I saw his eyes sparkle with tears. Yes, sure, answered my father. I hope I accept an apology better than you. With those last words, my father turned away from Kieran and headed towards the food table. Of course, the dinner was not the most joyful. Dad didn't say a word as Mom talked about his cancer. Too advanced for any hope of recovery. We picked at our plates, but no one really ate. Half an hour later, Mary left for a party where there were supposed to be boys and girls. She didn't want to go there, but we all insisted that she go. Mark drove her and then returned to Kieran's apartment. Mom and Dad left soon after. Mom wanted to help clean up. But Kieran, a few more points in his favor after the apology and obvious upset over his father's condition, convinced her that he would help me clean up. And so Kieran and I were alone for the first time in a year. He began to carry the plates from the table to the kitchen. There he turned on the hot water and began putting dirty dishes in the sink. I busied myself with putting leftover food into containers. We worked in complete silence. Everything seemed unreal. We've done this so many times, it felt like I had gone back in time. I couldn't stand it and started crying. I took a towel and started drying the plates. After a few minutes of hearing my sobs, Kieran finally said something that wasn't an insult. I'm really sorry about your father. Mary and Mark will be heartbroken. I couldn't help myself. I sat down on a chair in the kitchen and burst into tears. Kieran approached me cautiously. I know what it's like to lose a parent. Hold on to these last days and enjoy them while they're here, he said. Then he put his hand on my shoulder. Instead of calming me down, it increased my sadness tenfold. I jumped up from the chair and hugged him. I held him like there was no tomorrow. I felt a huge sense of relief as I cried on his shoulder. Carefully, he put his arm around my shoulders. This gesture helped me focus on something other than my father's illness. I so missed his tender attention, his loving presence in the little things of our daily lives. I still wanted him back. I squeezed him even tighter. I raised my face to his and said, I miss you. I love you, Kieran. His eyes were full of tears, and I mistook this for reciprocal love. I grabbed his head and kissed him. He didn't kiss back, but I still felt something. My mistake was that I took this as a sign that he still desired me when in fact it was simply an echo of his sexual frustration due to long-term abstinence. I wanted him so bad. Any touch was better than no touch at all for the past year. I was overwhelmed by my own desire for him, any intimacy. I love you, Kieran. I need you. Come back to me. Don't leave us. Please make love to me, I said. What happened next was unexpected for me. His gaze went from worried to cold and distant. He pulled out of my embrace and pushed me away, and then he had sex with me. As soon as he finished, he simply pulled up his pants and walked out of the kitchen. Silently, I followed him into the living room. He walked to the door and left. I spent the remaining hours crying both because of my father's illness and because of Kieran's complete rejection of me. Curran, I thought that my anger was almost gone, leaving only cold feelings. How wrong I was. I couldn't believe what a bitch Eileen turned out to be. Use your father's illness to make me feel guilty about our divorce? Not only was she playing on my guilt for hurting Mary, but now she was using her own father, who hated me, to make me feel sorry for her. Fuck her, and I had sex with her. I don't think I'll fall for such tricks again. I vowed to avoid her at all costs. Well, those were my thoughts at the time. Six months later, Mary told me that her grandfather had passed away, right before Christmas. Crap. I had a family reunion waiting for me again. I wonder what Eileen will do this time. I went to the funeral with Mark. Thank God that he remains attached to me. Mary was with her grandmother and Eileen. There was a small ceremony with speeches in memory of the deceased, including a very weak speech from Eileen, 
in which all her words seemed to be directed towards me, especially her mentions of undying love between spouses. Then relatives and friends approached the coffin to pray over the deceased. I politely left the funeral hall as soon as I could. I managed to happily avoid any contact with Eileen. A few months later, Mark got married. His girlfriend since freshman year of college, Rebecca, was a cute little girl, only about 160 centimeters tall. They looked really good together. Mary came to the wedding with a young man she met in college. He was quite smart, although a bit verbose. I think he was trying to impress me. Eileen came with her mother. This made it difficult to avoid it, but I did my best. I still had a feeling of guilt towards my grandmother. Luckily, I came to the wedding with an escort, a real female escort. She was a young woman of 25 years old, a little older than my Mary. Before the wedding, I took her to a fashionable women's clothing store. Her dress and makeup were so discreet that no one would have thought that she was a woman of easy virtue. I noticed that Eileen glanced at us from time to time, and this gave me pleasure. I wanted her to feel bad that I was with a young woman. I managed to avoid her all evening. To be honest, I felt a little guilty about what happened between us in her kitchen the last time. But nothing lasts forever. At one point, I was standing at the cocktail table, pouring myself another glass, when Eileen suddenly appeared next to me. They look wonderful, don't they? She asked without looking at me. Without looking in her direction, I glanced at Mark and Rebecca. Yes, I wonder how long this will last. Five years? Ten years? Twenty-two years? Until she starts cheating on him. I swear it felt like a slap in the face. Eileen pulled away from me and turned to leave. I hope I live to see this happen. You won't be able to help her then, I said loudly after her. The intimacy of the night could not distract me from the oppressive feeling that settled in my stomach. When will I learn to let go of Eileen? Everything I did, all my thoughts were always connected with her. This needed to be changed. I needed to change something in my life. I definitely needed to do something with my life. It took me a while, but I finally decided to listen to Tammy and agree to the date. When I told her about this, she jumped on my neck and hugged me tightly, to which I responded enthusiastically. Tammy was a very attractive and well-built woman. My natural reaction was that my body reacted. Oh, wow, she exclaimed. Looks like I know someone who really needs a date and soon. She moved away slightly. Very soon, she didn't hesitate. The next day, there was a note on my desk with the name Cindy, the date, time, Friday at 8 p.m., and the name of a restaurant in the city center. Here's your date. Be there, was all she said. Well, Tammy knew me well enough so I decided to give it a try. The next Saturday at 1940, I was already at the restaurant and waiting for my date. The head waiter brought a pretty brunette about 40 years old to my table. Cindy was very pretty and elegantly dressed. Approximately 170 centimeters tall, she had a charming smile and was a little shy, which piqued my interest. She let me choose all the dishes and we talked a lot during dinner. Tammy was right, Cindy was a great option. During the taxi ride to my apartment, we simply held hands. The evening was just beginning. In the apartment, Cindy's behavior changed. She became more decisive, which I quite liked. I hope you don't think I'm promiscuous, she said. But according to Tammy, you're a wonderful lover, and I really need that. We had sex. Wow, Tammy was right. You really know how to please a woman. It's a pity that my husband can't learn from you she said. I jumped to my feet. What? I asked angrily. Are you married? You don't even wear a ring. Cindy stood up and tried to touch me, but I pushed her hand away. Hey, no need to be rude. My husband and I have been on and off for six years now. Now everything seems to be getting better. She reached out to me again, and I took a step back. But now that I've met you, I think things will go wrong again, she said rubbing her thumb on her ring finger, where the ring was not. I was furious. I was absolutely furious with this liar and Tammy for allowing this to happen. I took the phone and called a taxi. Cindy was already standing, surprised by what was happening. What happened to you? She asked while I quickly got dressed. 
A minute ago you had sex with me, and now you're kicking me out? This is all? Quick sex, and thank you, madam? Her anger didn't make me feel guilty. On the contrary, he made me even more angry. Get dressed immediately. The taxi will arrive soon, and I want you to get out of my apartment as quickly as possible, I shouted at her. I felt a surge of rage throughout my body. I knew my face was red and looked scary. Cindy pulled back and began to get dressed, sobbing. I tried to calm down a little and spoke in a more even tone. I just went through a divorce because my wife cheated on me, and I just want you out of my sight. Now, you are the worst thing that can happen to a man, so get out. She quickly left. I didn't have to fight with Tammy because she called the next day to apologize. She didn't know that Cindy had gotten back together with her husband. But at least I can say one thing for sure. Cindy confirmed that you had sex with her properly. You have not yet lost your mastery of female pleasures, lover. I promise I'll be more careful next time. She tried to cheer me up, but I gave up on any dates for the next few weeks. There was an important date ahead on my calendar. Eileen and I's 25th wedding anniversary was in a few weeks. I couldn't get it out of my head. One evening, while completely drunk, I ordered some postcards of Hawaii, where we planned to go for our second honeymoon. A few days later, when the cards arrived, I chose one with a picture of a couple scuba diving among coral. I wrote the date of our anniversary on it and added, It's a pity that you turned out to be a woman of easy virtue. It could be us. I put a stamp on it and sent a postcard. Three days later, Mary called me, very angry. What did you do to mom again? She asked, furious. She's been coping so well lately, and now she's crying again. God, Dad, what have you done this time? How do I respond to this without revealing that I was a complete jerk? Regardless, I still cared what Mary thought of me. We hadn't seen each other that much lately because of her college and friends, but I still wanted to keep our cozy evenings together. Well, I thought, the truth may hurt, but it's better than lying. I'm sorry you had to go through that, honey. Yes, I made a mistake. You know, yesterday marked 25 years since your mother and I got married, and I couldn't get it out of my head and again, I felt angry at your mom for ruining our lives. I'm really sorry. I told her about the card. Oh, you too. You can't pull yourself together and realize that you're still madly in love with each other. You were drunk when you did it, right? She asked. Yes, admitted her. Dad, can you promise me that you will never do anything related to mom when you're drunk again? She asked, calming down slightly. For you, and only you, I promise. And I'm not the one who breaks promises in this family, I said. Dad, she answered. Oh, sorry. It doesn't matter, she said. By the way, I have good news for you, she continued. David proposed. The rest of the conversation was a little awkward. I didn't want to hurt her feelings, but I couldn't react happily to the fact that my daughter was getting married so early. Despite all my warnings and reproaches, the fact remained. My baby was getting married in two months. Before this happened, another important thing happened. Vicky finally reached an agreement with the lawyer of my ex-wife's lover. We were filing a lawsuit for half a million dollars and preparing for trial when they offered to settle the case for $150,000 plus my attorney's fees, including divorce costs. Take this offer and run, Vicky said. I did so, and the next day I called the contractor to discuss building my retirement home. With the economy slowing, he happily agreed to start work next month. Over the next two months, I had mixed feelings. On the one hand, I was losing my daughter. I don't think any father takes it easy, but eventually they have to leave the nest one day. I learned from Mary that Eileen felt the same way. On the other hand, my fantasy retirement home was under construction. Home just for me. During this time I had several drunken evenings, but, keeping my promise, I did nothing to worsen the situation with Eileen, and the impulses almost disappeared, and those that arose I suppressed. The first event was the wedding. I had to take my daughter to the priest, trying not to look gloomy. At the reception after the wedding, they sat Eileen next to me. We were both alone. David's parents easily sensed the discomfort that Eileen and I felt. 
Not a word was said between us the entire evening. I noticed Eileen looking at me several times, but I stayed strong and avoided her. She looked stunning in her navy blue dress, and it made being around her both easier and more difficult. I stole glances at her more than once. What can I say? She was the most beautiful woman at the party. She, like me, interacted with David's parents, and her wit was still the same. For Mary's sake, I resisted the urge to get drunk, but it was difficult, very difficult. I left as soon as Mary left the party. How many caustic remarks can you take before breaking down? Then, in early December, construction of my house was completed. He was amazing. Three bedrooms, an office for my computer, a large living room adjacent to the dining room, and a spacious kitchen so that I can show off my culinary skills. The only thing missing was a garage, which would have included a couple of workshops for Eileen and me. The only thing missing was a loving wife by his side. I terminated the lease on my apartment, bought some furniture, and moved. Leaving for work early in the morning and returning early or late to avoid traffic jams, I spent a little over an hour on the road. It also meant that I had to pull myself together and cut down on my drinking. A taxi wouldn't have taken me that far. The distance also created difficulties in terms of dating. I shared this with Tammy. After Mary's wedding, I went on a few dates, but I wasn't particularly attracted to the women I met. Some of them ended up in my bed, but that was all, which, however, was not bad. Honestly, they all had the same flaw. They weren't Eileen. Some were just as beautiful, witty, and funny, but I kept comparing them to my ex-wife. Tammy was not discouraged by my reluctance to agree to all the dates she arranged and kept trying. I still had a lot of work to do on myself before I could move forward with my life. Over the next months, I went on a few dates, but soon realized that this dating scenario was not for me. I never felt comfortable enough with these women to be myself. I didn't feel insecure. I just wasn't interested. It became more and more difficult for me to pretend to be charming. Was I preparing for life alone? Is this what awaited me in my old age? I didn't know. All I knew was that I was gradually withdrawing into myself. I stopped focusing on trying to be happy. The only reminder of my former happy life were my children, but now they had their own lives. When Mary lived at home, I had many opportunities to be with her. But now it seemed that the most I could achieve was to see her once every two months. I was a little jealous that she saw her mother more often, but living an hour outside the city, I knew she wouldn't just stop by on her way back home. At work, I also felt disconnected from my position and colleagues. Don't get me wrong, Tammy and Mike are wonderful people to be around. But while I was ready to retire at 47, by my 52nd birthday, I was completely fed up with my job. I set up my office at home, making it a replica of my office at work and most of the time I just worked from home, coming into town maybe once or twice a week. Without constant distractions and saving two hours of commuting every day, my productivity did not suffer. I even became more productive. It was easier to dive into projects, check every line of code, and submit programs for testing without errors. My birthday went smoothly. Mark and Mary called me, and I received a birthday card signed by Mary, her husband and Eileen. When I saw her signature, I didn't feel anything. I didn't even care. One Saturday afternoon in June, I heard a car drive up. I looked and saw Mary's little car. I was delighted with this unexpected visit and went out to her on the back porch. Oh no, her face was in tears. She rushed up the stairs and fell into my arms. Oh, Dad, she was crying and tears were streaming down her cheeks. She tried to say something through her sobs, but it was unintelligible. The only words I caught were, Not, Mom. Did something happen to Eileen? This thought sent a wave of fear through me. Feelings that I had suppressed for the last five years came flooding back. Years of anger suddenly dissolved in a momentary vision of Eileen in trouble. The bitterness and resentment were pushed aside by a stronger feeling the strongest of all my love for the wife I had lost five years ago. All these years I knew, without admitting it, that the depth of my anger and the depth of the hurt from her betrayal only reflected the amount of love I felt for her. 
Without this colossal and deep-rooted love for Eileen, all feelings of anger and sadness would have left me long ago. In an instant, I realized how unfair I had been to all the women I had dated. They could never compare to the feelings I still had for Eileen. I realized that I was holding on to my anger, using it as a twisted way to maintain my love for Eileen, and now I could lose her. Did something happen to Mom? Is she... Is she injured? I asked, and tears welled up in my eyes. No. This is David. I... I found him in bed with another girl, Mary said and burst into tears again, sinking to the floor. I sat down next to her to comfort her and at the same time allow my legs to return to normal. They seemed like cotton wool and I was shaking all over. I hugged Mary and said a few words of comfort, both to her and to myself. My mobile phone rang. I wanted not to pick up the phone, but still decided to look at the screen. It was Eileen. I answered. Hi, that's all I said. I wasn't sure that my voice wouldn't reveal the ragged emotions I was still experiencing. Kieran, something happened to Mary. David just called and is looking all over for her, she said. I felt the panic that must have gripped her. I immediately calmed her down. It's okay, Eileen. She's here with me. She is completely broken. I'll call you back later. But what happened? What? She began, but I interrupted her. No, Eileen, I'll call you back as soon as I can. Trust me. I believe, she said and hung up. Finally, I convinced Mary to get up and go into the living room. When her tears subsided a little, I learned the same sad story of an unfaithful spouse and a broken heart. Everything will be fine, baby, I said. You have your mom and me to take care of you. After I go and beat the crap out of your husband, if that's okay. A faint smile flashed across her face. No need, Dad. I've already dealt with this. I... I broke my grandmother's vase, the one she gave me for my wedding. She broke it on his head. I looked at her, then laughed out loud. I kissed her and hugged her tightly. This is my girl. She pulled away a little from my embrace and kissed me deeply. Sorry, Dad. You have nothing to apologize for. It's not your fault. It's your idiot husband's fault, I said. She looked at me, all saturated with sadness. No, that's not why, Dad. I'm sorry I didn't understand what you went through when. When? I hugged her again. Don't, baby, it's all in the past, I said softly. And it was true. For the first time in five years, I was able to let go of the pain, sadness, bitterness, and betrayal I felt every time I thought about Eileen but I have you and my mother, and we left you alone. I love you, Dad. No words were needed. All she needed was a loving parent by her side while she healed her wounds. Dad, do you still hate Mom as much as I hate David now? She asked after a while, thoughtfully. Not so long ago my answer would have been, yes, with bitterness, but now I was not sure about that. The feelings I had when I mistakenly thought something had happened to Eileen made a lot of sense. I still cared about her, although I doubted that I could love her the same way as before. No, baby, these feelings go away over time, little by little. It will be easier for you. You are young, and now your mom will be busy again, chasing young guys from the door. I was very pleased that I was able to make her smile a little. Speaking of your mom, I said, I better call her back. She's worried. Do you have to do this? Asked Mary. That's why I came here. I knew you would understand. And Mom, stop talking nonsense, girl. Your mom loves you very much and is probably pacing the living room waiting for me to call. Eileen answered after the first ring. I had to explain what had happened and that I wasn't going to tell her off, but that Mary was completely broken and needed all my attention. She understood, and she understood why Mary came to me and not to her. To my own surprise, and probably to Eileen's, I didn't reproach her as I would have done not so long ago. I think she'll need to stay here for a while, but next week I'll go get her things and she'll move back in with you. It will be better this way since the college is near your home, I said. Do you mind? Yes, that will be better. Tell her to call me. Tell her I love her very, very much, Eileen said. I'll pass it on, 
Bye, Eileen. Don't worry about her, I replied. Young people recover quickly. She still felt betrayed and humiliated by her husband, but Mary pulled herself together pretty quickly. I spent a wonderful week with her two people who suffered in similar love situations in which they were not to blame. We had such a good time that I even let Eileen hug me when we brought Mary's things to her house. After that I went back to my meaningless life. I was taking a young prostitute back to her apartment in the city. She was a regular customer of mine and didn't mind coming to see me. I think in some ways she liked me and she liked the quiet environment of my country house. She was full of life and always spent at least half a day with me and sometimes stayed overnight. She always took care of my physical needs. On the way back, it started to fog. The fog turned to rain and then to downpour. I was just a few minutes from home. As I turned, the pickup began to slide into my lane. Instinctively, I turned the steering wheel sharply and lost control of the car. The last thing I remember was making a witty remark, damn, and then the car flew off the road into large trees. Eileen, it was my shift that Saturday. In my experience, this doesn't happen often, but due to the summer holidays, there weren't enough people and everyone had to help. The reports about me say, lead by example. I was in the Ent department, doing my usual administrative duties, when a friend approached me. Eileen, I think you should come down with me, she said coldly. I was puzzled. Go down meant the emergency room or emergency room. There must have been an emergency because she headed for the stairs without waiting for the elevator. She almost ran. Hey, wait, what happened? Jumping two steps, she replied. The car went off Route 129. His condition is very serious. This is... She didn't have time to finish. Kieran, I screamed. A wave of adrenaline rushed through me, spreading heat throughout my entire body. I overtook her, flying down the stairs. Another friend stopped me in the emergency room. Sorry, Eileen, you can't go there. This is Kieran. We don't yet know how serious his injuries are, but there are suspicions of internal injuries and his chest is badly crushed. The lung is definitely punctured, but we have to operate on it. Call the kids and I'll let you know what we find out. Then another nurse, two orderlies, and a doctor emerged from the emergency room, wheeling a gurney into the operating room. Despite all the injuries I saw, all the wounds I helped treat, the sight of him on the gurney was unbearable. In one second I realized that the matter was really serious. I grabbed onto my friend to keep from falling as my legs were giving way. Nurses are either strong or have good knowledge of physics. My friend immediately noticed the obvious signs that I was about to pass out. She picked me up and deftly helped me sit on a chair in the hallway. I know this is hard for you, Eileen, but you have to pull yourself together. The kids need to be told, and they need their mom. Take a few minutes to compose yourself, and then start making calls. I'll be back soon, she said and headed towards the operating room. My other friend stayed by my side. Finally, the haze disappeared from before my eyes, but I began to choke. Calm down now, Eileen. Breathe deeply and slowly. Hold your breath and then exhale once again. She helped me calm down. And then I started crying. I probably looked pathetic in this department. My friend continued to encourage me to calm down and prepare to talk to the children. She firmly insisted that we need to think about the children. Old trick. We all do this to keep the patient's family and friend's attention focused on something else, something important, or someone who is not on the verge of death. I knew it, but it worked. I was still crying and sobbing, but I had calmed down enough to ask my friend to bring me the phone. It was hard for me to call them. I started with the more balanced Mark. I didn't have to explain much, and within a minute he was on his way to the airport. With Mary, it was more difficult. Ever since she started having problems in her marriage, her father has become her everything. I sometimes found it difficult when she rightly drew parallels between David's behavior and mine, but her dad was the most important parent in her life. Soon she was in my arms and we were crying together. Curran. I felt heavy and completely numb. I remember how I once woke up on my bed, there was no one nearby, and machine signals were sounding in the background. 
I couldn't turn my head. I tried to concentrate on the room, but I couldn't. I tried to move, but felt a sharp pain shooting through my chest. Oh, then someone came to the foot of my bed. Nurse, she turned to her left and said, he seems to be coming to his senses. Then I saw Eileen, she looked pale and sick. I lost consciousness again. I opened my eyes again. Now I was in another room. The nurse observed the readings on the monitor. I tried to turn my head, but it was fixed in the cervical collar and pain shot through my neck. Oh, the nurse turned to me. Well, welcome back to the living. She glanced at my map. Mr. O'Malley, I'll call the doctor now. Indeed, soon a doctor entered the room. I vaguely recognized him. I've seen him several times before. Hi, Kieran. I'm happy to say that you will recover, but it will be a long process. Minor injuries first. Broken jaw, broken nose, but luckily you escaped serious head injuries. You have a few cracks in your tibias, but the brunt of the impact was on your femurs. You have a fractured right femur and damage to your hip bone. It will take time before you can walk normally. The most painful injuries are probably to the ribs. Several were broken, a lung was punctured, and many ribs were cracked. With the exception of the lung on the left side, the ribs did not damage other organs, only soft tissue here and there. Now for the worst part. Get ready. Your mechanic said the car is beyond repair. He looked at me with a slight smile. Sorry about that. You have all my condolences. Now it's time for a little family process. One by one, good luck with your recovery. Soon after this, Mary entered the room. She approached the bed hesitantly and then hugged me carefully. I was so, so scared for you, Dad. And she began to cry. My only limbs that didn't seem to be fixed to the bed were my arms, so I gently hugged her. God, even small movements hurt, but nothing unbearable, I was under the influence of painkillers. She cried the entire time she was around. Then Mark came. Hello, old man, you look like crap, he said and hugged me carefully. I don't want to break any more bones for you. I tried to say that I was tougher than I looked, but with my chin fixed, it sounded like, I'm so tough. Wow, he exclaimed. Wait, mom finds out that you can't talk. He spent his moment making fun of me. Eileen was next. Despite her extreme pallor and obvious fatigue, she looked as beautiful as ever. She just came up to me and took my hand in hers. You scared us, she said simply. Then her face scrunched up and tears streamed from her eyes. I was so afraid of losing you. It's funny because I was lost to her five years ago. She pressed my hand to her face, kissing it again and again. I know you don't like it when I say this, but I love you so much, she said, and then leaned down and kissed my lips tenderly. A tear fell from her eye onto my face. Shortly after that, the nurse returned, pressed a button on the machine, and I fell asleep again. I spent two whole weeks in the hospital. Mark had to go back to work, but Mary and Eileen were always there. Every evening they came to my room and planned my recovery. I didn't really participate in these discussions, not only because he could not speak normally, but also because interfering with the plans of women in this family is an unsafe business. I wasn't so unconscious that I didn't realize the step I'd just taken in calling Eileen part of my family. What options did I have? On the one hand, she constantly hovered around me, allowing herself little touches and kisses, repeating over and over again how much she loved me and this feeling gave me an anxious pleasure. More than once I suppressed the desire to respond to her kisses. On the other hand, being mostly motionless, I was completely at their mercy. They achieved real success by moving me home. I was encased in plaster casts from waist to toe and wore a variety of soft and hard supports on my torso. The head was still secured in a cervical collar and the jaw was still in braces. The nose was still in a hard bandage I was sore all over, but the worst part was in my chest, where my ribs were healing. Many of Eileen's friends came to help with the move from the hospital to a guest room in Eileen's house, our former home. Mark flew in for this occasion. Tammy and Mike were there too with lots of well wishes from the entire team at work. Even my grandmother, who looked very fragile, came and hugged me. 
The bedroom was set up like a hospital room. They wheeled me into a wheelchair and put me to bed. Soon all the guests left, even Mark. I was a little nervous about sleeping in my old house for the first time in five years. Besides, it's one thing to have professionals help you go to the toilet. It's completely different when your ex-wife and daughter are doing it. It was awkward, to say the least. That evening Mary and Eileen continued to fuss over me. After some time, when I began to feel sleepy, Eileen sent Mary to bed. She continued to fuss and then settled herself down, sitting on the bed next to me. You'd probably rather be somewhere else, but please, for Mary's sake, let me take care of you, let the us take care of you, she finally said. But your job, I wanted to say, you are okay. They learned to understand my speech. Don't worry, honey, I took a few weeks off. There was nothing to be done, I just had to submit to the will of the girls. I freed myself from my armor piece by piece. First, the cervical collar was removed, and it was very nice to move my head again. It crunched from my first movements, but then I felt free although only from the upper part of the chest to the lower jaw. Then after a few days, they removed the bandage from the nose. Mary screamed. Dad, you look terrible. Your nose. It. It's terrible. Eileen laughed. It's not so bad, dear. The swelling will go down soon, and those black and yellow circles around his eyes match perfectly with the dark rings underneath them. What do you say, Mary? Mary laughed slightly. He'd be great in a zombie movie. I extended my arms in front of me and began to sway from side to side like a zombie. But the joke backfired on me because pain shot through my chest and my imitation of a zombie growling came out as ouch. They both laughed, and this immediately took my mind off the pain. The next thing I got rid of was a real blessing braces on my jaw. Finally, I was able to speak normally. Mary kissed me carefully first. Can you talk now? She asked. I stretched my jaw again. Finally, I can finally tell you that for the last three weeks, I have had this terrible itch in the middle of my back, I said. Mary opened her mouth wide. Oh, Dad, I'm so sorry. I... I started giggling. Just kidding, baby, just kidding. Feigning indignation, she gently slapped me on the shoulder with the back of her hand, just like her mother. Oh, you. I hugged her and kissed her deeply. Mary, I said, all I've wanted to say these past few weeks is thank you, thank you, and thank you. And then more kisses followed, from which she was delighted. Then Eileen came up. We were a little confused. Feeling this, Mary left the room. I reached out and took her hand. We sat there in silence, holding hands. I was filled with conflicting feelings. Guilt and gratitude were at the forefront, but a long-forgotten feeling also returned. Finally freed from my collar, I didn't know what to say. I loved Eileen. I have never loved anyone so much, and probably never will again. Her hand was shaking. I squeezed her a little tighter for a second. Like me, tears welled up in her eyes. Well, did you swallow your tongue? She finally said. I have too many words, and they are fighting to come out, I answered simply. Where do I start with thank you? She suggested. Not without a kiss, I said. She hesitated a little, and then kissed me on the lips. Then I moved her head a few centimeters away from my face, and looked into her beautiful green eyes. I had looked at them many times over the past years, but never with the same desire that now flared up within me again. I felt the same love and need coming from her. But all these years, I easily blocked it out as soon as I sank into my emotional wounds. Now I didn't want that. I wanted to please her beautiful eyes, to fill them with life and love again. I love you. Never stopped loving, I said with difficulty. My throat tightened just like it did when I had the brace on. It wasn't what I expected, but it probably should have been. Tears flowed from her eyes, dripping onto my face. Oh, Kieran, I love you, I love you, I love you so much, she replied, breathless with joy and relief. And she kissed me passionately, with love accumulated over five years of disappointment, pain, hatred, guilt, love, and more pain. I think we kissed for an hour. We had to make up for five years of lost kisses. At that hour, all symptoms of bodily pain left me. 
Five years of pain were erased in this moment of truth. It took time for my body to fully recover, but it happened much faster than the restoration of my relationship with Eileen. Two months after all my casts and braces were removed, I was ready to move back into my home. I still needed crutches to get around, but I was far from disabled. However, there were some problems with my plan to return home. First of all, I didn't have a car. My insurance covered the damages, but I still needed to buy a car. Even if I accepted Eileen's offer to drive me home, it would be almost impossible for me to live in a country house without a car. The day after I realized this, Eileen had a rental car in my driveway. My departure was inevitable, and this darkened the atmosphere in the house. Secondly, my girls. Mary was upset when I announced that I was leaving the next day. She didn't want me to leave. Taking care of me really helped her cope with her own divorce and focus on something other than her own pain. I was her way of keeping her sanity, but I believed she was recovering pretty quickly. I knew that Eileen would still be there for her, and she also understood that her mother and I had come a long way towards repairing our relationship. Seeing me leave, she again felt the pain of separation and perhaps hostility. I had to calm her down when Eileen wasn't around. Listen, baby, I've learned two things over the past few months. The first is that I always loved your mother, but my wounds were too great to overcome and allow that love to surface again. I know that you understand that the pain of her betrayal will always be with me, at least in my memories. I will never forget this, and I don't know if I can forgive her. My home is no longer here, and your mother is no longer part of my home. I don't know what will come of our reconciliation, but feeling peace with your mother is as good as the time I spent with you. I must have been convincing because she didn't say a word and just threw her arms around my neck, sobbing and hugging me tightly. Farewell if you must leave. But I know she loves you very much, she said through sobs. It wasn't so easy with Eileen. We both felt very awkward. I waited until Mary went to bed to talk quietly to Eileen. As she did every evening, she played the role of caring nurse, asking about my condition, using her professionalism to touch my body all over, I joked. We reached a compromise in our conflicting feelings, and small sexual innuendos became part of it. She smiled, but continued to silently look after me. Finally, her beautiful green eyes full of sadness, she turned to me and spoke. Tomorrow you are leaving. It was a calm statement, not a question. What? What will happen to us? I felt that she wanted to say more, to express her desires on this matter, but she did not. Silence grew between us. I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to say. I needed to think a little more about the concept of we. I knew she meant her, me and Mary. Does we exist, Kieran? She finally asked, breaking the silence. Not now. Now there is no us. Everything is broken. Everything has been broken for the last seven years. She winced at my answer. Can us be restored? She asked almost in a whisper. I don't know the answer to that question. But there is love, she finally looked at me. Yes, there is love, but there is also something else. There is pain and fear, I said after a few seconds of silence. Fear, she asked again. Yes, pain and fear of betrayal and lies. Lies hurt more, much more. The betrayal was in all these lies that went on for so long. They still hurt me. Sex didn't matter that much. We had sex with another couple. We didn't go very far but we did it together, openly, without lies. It was a mistake, but a common mistake. Yes, I agree, it matters. Can a liar be trusted again? What if the liar sincerely repents? How can I believe this, I said with slight bitterness. Would you believe it if she told you that she was faithful all these years? What was waiting for you? Will it be a lie? She shrugged. It's impossible to prove, it's impossible to disprove. But there is love. She has always been in me, and I think you love me again, Eileen said softly, her eyes full of hope. Yes, I love you, and I know that you love me, I agreed. Hesitantly, she moved closer to me on the sofa, took my hand, and put her head on my shoulder. You can't deny it anymore, I finally added. What else do you need? Forgiveness. Is this possible? 
Forgive what? I asked. Sex or lies? She answered with a question. Betrayal and lies, I finally said. Can they be forgiven? Is it possible to forgive the lost five years? Five years of suffering every day. Five years of feeling less than a man. Five years when only my children kept me from despair. We fell silent again. I would have a hard time forgiving this, Eileen finally said. And it's impossible to forget it. Never forget. But isn't loving each other the beginning? I thought about her question for a moment. The beginning of what? Second chance begins. What kind of second chance will it be if there is no forgiveness and if it is impossible to forget? We'll just go back to the possibility that lies will appear again. There was love, strong and beautiful, as I thought, to protect us. And then came the lies. Why trust love again? Can you live without her? Asked Eileen. Yeah, but it's a lousy life, I had to admit. Is there another love waiting for you somewhere? Probably, but the chances of finding a love as deep as ours are slim, I said, feeling depressed. I know. I don't know if we can start over. Can we find that same passion again? Can we rekindle that spark? Or is that too much, Kieran? Maybe it's too much, but can we live happily without each other? I can't. I can't either. Can I start slow? asked Eileen. Like just friends, and see what happens, I thought for a few seconds. Maybe. It's not as satisfying, but I can live with it, Kieran, if it means you'll still be a part of my life, even if I ruined what we had. I will never give up the opportunity to be with you. But, but I love you so much, can you handle it? I need this. What kind of friends share children among themselves? Close friends. Friends with history. Like friends with the right to have sex. That's where we started. What if I keep that promise? I've been waiting for this for so long. And we made love, carefully because my ribs still hurt, but with the love that had accumulated over five long years of disappointment. And it helped me to believe that for these five years Eileen was faithful to me, that she had no lovers all these years. I returned to my house. I still had several contracts with my former employer, but I am now officially retired. Mary and Eileen were frequent visitors, especially in the beginning when my ability to move around was limited. At first they stayed in the guest rooms, but after several visits, Eileen always woke up in my bed, and then she started sharing my bed. This delighted Mary and did not stop until the end of her teasing me. We started gradually. Frankly, it took me a while to get back to who I was before her betrayal. Part of me wanted to bask in our renewed love, but the other part constantly resisted, unable to forget the pain. Day after day, week after week, month after month, Eileen had to put up with my mood swings. One moment I was a loving boyfriend, and the next I was again a cold and distrustful partner. Eileen endured all this. I knew that her unwavering faith in me was her way of apologizing and repenting for her past infidelity, her behavior riddled with shame. Many times we cried together without needing an explanation, realizing that we both suffered from lost time and love that we tried to return. More than once I was close to giving up everything and ending our restored relationship. Several times I even kicked her out of the house and then called her again and apologized. Her answer was always the same, no need to apologize. For example, one Friday evening we agreed that Eileen would come over to my place right after work to spend the weekend. Having been delayed at work at the hospital, she arrived an hour and a half later than I expected. I was broken. Too many bad memories came flooding back and I was on the verge of a breakdown. Eileen responded with her usual patient love and tender attention to my mood. Her love brought me back into a good mood, but later, we did not make love. She cried in my arms. We tried to keep things simple, but when Mary finally moved in with her new boyfriend, Eileen asked me if she could sell her house and move in with me permanently. I said no. A few months later, I changed my mind. We used some of the proceeds from the sale of her house to build a garage for her studio, and it makes me very happy to know that Eileen spends time upstairs creating a new painting. 
She has also retired, and we now often travel around the country and the world to find new sources of inspiration for her work. And that's exactly how it should have been. I must confess that our love, despite all our efforts, was never fully restored. She is no longer what she once was. Now this is just a shadow of that bright, all-consuming passion that united us in the past. I still love her, but I'm not as in love with her as I was before. This difference became obvious to me over time. I once felt that my world would not be complete without her, but now our relationship is more reminiscent of habitual affection, something familiar, reliable, but not causing the spark that once made my heart beat faster. However, despite this, the love we share now is strong and even valuable in its own way. She may not be as fiery as before, but she is much deeper, more mature than what we had at the beginning. It is not a passion that consumes, but something more sustainable that gives us the opportunity to move forward. And although it does not bring the same intense emotions, I understand that this form of love is better and more reliable than much of what we could find somewhere else. If we had gone our separate ways, I'm not sure we would have found anything as important or meaningful, if anything at all. I don't know if anything will change in the future. Perhaps life will shed new light on us or give us unexpected turns. But now, I think that maybe this will continue. Eileen is sincerely trying to return the old feelings to revive the passion that connected us before. She is doing everything possible so that we again become those people who once loved each other without looking back, with ardor and excitement. Sometimes, when I see her desperation, when I see her trying to hold on to what we had, I pretend. I pretend to believe that we can bring back at least some of the passion that once simmered between us. But deep down I know the truth. Something is broken, and despite my best efforts, I still feel like it's not right. Time, wounds, betrayal, they have left their mark, and sometimes it seems to me that it is simply impossible to restore what we had. We move on, but the part of us that was once full of fire no longer burns the way it used to. As time goes by, it becomes easier to pretend and just enjoy the moment. These moments, when the mere sight of Eileen makes me hold my breath and be glad that she is there, are becoming more and more frequent. Her expressions of love and passion increasingly resonate. I feel like there is hope. Yes, I apologized to my grandmother for my fight with Hike when he announced his illness, but she and Eileen had already agreed that I meant no harm by wanting him dead. She made the apology process easier for me by saying, I always knew you two would get back together. You are too good a person for me to think otherwise. I helped her believe in you even after that evening. Eileen and I never got married again. What's the point of a piece of paper? We love each other, live together, and grow old together. In the end, it's all I ever wanted. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.